Are you ready to do a vocal lesson? I'm ready to do a vocal lesson. Why don't we start with a little me, me, me? Yeah, make me sing my the one I'm most scared of. Me, 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 me. I guess it's that, but you would go all the way up, right? Yeah, do that again. Me, 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 me. All right, I, I don't know what you're scared of because you made that sound so easy. Me, 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 me. Yeah, it's really hard to do though because I'm hyper-focused. I'm like hyper-focused on being relaxed on a E vowel where I'm feeling like I'm less open. I start to kind of trip myself up. Even just doing it there, I had to be like, all right, we're going to do this, but you got to relax, man. You don't have to be so tight. <laughs> This is Backstage Pass. I'm Eric Vitro. In this podcast, I'm inviting you into my studio to hear how some of the most successful and famous singers work on their craft, the art of singing. They also happen to be students of mine, so I have to say I know them pretty well. We'll talk about everything, their vocal process, their careers, how their emotional life affects their voice, and how it all intertwines with their lives. That was me talking with Sean Mendez. You'll know his songs like Stitches, Mercy, Treat You Better, If I Can't Have You, There's Nothing Holding Me Back, Wonder, and also Spotify's most streamed song of 2019, his duet with his girlfriend Camila Cabello called Señorita. Now, don't worry, you'll get to hear from Camila Cabello in a future episode later this season. Sean's really close to his family. In fact, they were his earliest audience. I remember the first time I sang for my mom and like my family, it was The Climb by Miley Cyrus. I went into my kitchen and uh, I played the music and I was shaking because I was like singing in front of my mom and my aunt and my cousins. And I sang the whole song with my eyes closed and I opened up the eyes and I'm pretty sure my mom was crying and everyone was crying. And I was like, wow, <laughs> it was really sweet. So she still tries to get me to do that in the kitchen sometimes. Someday you've got to record that for her as a gift. You know what I did for Mother's Day? I recorded her favorite song is Fast Car by Tracy Chapman. I was away because of the quarantine, so I recorded that for her. You've got a fast car. I'll get it to get to anywhere. Maybe we can make a change. I remember when I first started learning guitar, I picked up the guitar and she's like, just learn this song from me, please. And that was probably like the first or second song I ever learned on guitar, too. It didn't take long for Sean to figure out what he needed to do. Now, even though he got a standing ovation and quite an emotional response from his kitchen audience, young Sean decided to move his performances to a somewhat wider audience on Vine. Vine no longer exists, but for those of you who don't know or have forgotten, it was a platform where you could share six-second-long videos like this one. Hello from the other side. Or this one, which got millions of views. I'll be a soldier. They were doing like a Viners meetup in downtown Toronto. And they asked me to come and, and just be there. So my parents were like, should we come? I said, no, no one's going to know who I am there. I don't really think anyone's going to know me. And then when I got there, I kind of was walking up the subway to like the main area on Dundas Square. And I remember just like mayhem started. And I finally found my way to the stage and got to perform for like a couple hundred people just with a mic and an acoustic guitar. And I remember this feeling of like performing for people and with people. They were singing along. I came home freaking out to my parents. I was like, you're not going to believe what happened. Like all these people were, were listening to me sing songs. And when I thought, okay, you know what? I want to be a performer. I want to be an artist was that very first time in Toronto. And I, and I was lucky because I got to do it in front of people who knew who I was because of the social media platform. And, and it was this like such a great first experience for me. I guess like ever since that moment when I like really got to perform for people for the first time with no lights and no cameras and just a, an acoustic guitar. I, I was kind of in love right off the bat. And there's a couple hundred people cheering and they're super excited. There's this obviously this confidence boost you get and you're like, okay, well, if a couple hundred people are, are liking this, then maybe a couple hundred thousand people will like this and maybe a couple million people will like this. And I think that 
it only takes a couple to kind of ignite that flame of, I'm going to take this all the way. Did you feel that way right from the start? Yeah, I think I always had this grand vision of where things can go. And I owe a lot of that to my parents for being so, you can do anything. You can do absolutely anything. And I feel really lucky and blessed because I know that a lot of people may not have the support that they necessarily need to go the distance. And I feel like more support than anyone even ever talks about or ever hears about is necessary for success. I got to see Sean play at the Rogers Center in Toronto. It's his home base, so of course it was a really special show. I just want to take a moment to say, with all of my heart, to every single person in this room, thank you so much for coming out. It's I watched the show with his family and his friends and, of course, Camila. His mother was right in front of me. She looked like every other teenager in the crowd, singing along, dancing, and enjoying the best concert of her life. I don't know if she could have ever imagined just how successful he was going to become, but I knew. And I think on some level, Sean always knew. My favorite story is when you said you used to walk around the house with the ball between your legs when you were into the soccer phase. Yeah, I would have like a soccer ball between my feet all the time because I was like, this is either going to go to the World Cup or nowhere. (laughs) (laughs) And that's how you approach the singing. It was the same with the singing. When I say Sean's discipline, do I ever mean it? (laughs) I'm already singing in the lesson 10 minutes before we start a lesson. I'm doing my pre-warm-up warm-up. (laughs) (laughs) I I know. I love that, though. And that's just you, right? Totally. I think the truth is, like, everybody has a different real, like, passion and a real desire within them. And not everyone's going to be, you know, as obsessive about singing as I am. But they're going to have something. And I think the trick to success in your life is finding the thing that you really love and putting all of your energy into that. Because that is when you're going to get real reward from what you do. The truth is you have to practice really, really hard and you have to work really, really hard. But you also have to be really, really patient because things that are great take a long time. I think in every single profession, there's so many times, especially when things get bigger, where it's really hard and really exhausting. But there's always this kind of flame that can't burn out for what you do and this this love for what you do. And, right, you know. right. Well, I like the fact that you did have an obsession before singing, and that was with soccer, only because it's showing that you really got to find the one thing that you really love, and it might change along the way. Yeah, I mean, I played soccer, and I played hockey, and I played baseball. <laughs> I played a ton of sports, and I even took like a, a drama, like acting class where I was like, <laughs> I played Prince Charming in a play when I was like 13. And I was testing all of the waters out before singing and playing guitar came along. And there's a very clear difference between something that you like to do and something that is your passion. Because when it's your passion, you start doing it and then four hours go by and and you wonder where the time went. I think that anyone who has a passion will know when I talk about this little tingly feeling that you get when you're doing the thing that you love to do. And even if you get five seconds of like euphoria through your body because you sang it one certain way or you played a chord a certain way or whatever you're doing, you're painting, you're doing anything. That little five seconds of euphoria makes a lifetime of work really exciting and, and desirable. You know what I mean? And I also think it's really important to say that if you feel like you haven't found your passion and you've tried a lot of things, it doesn't mean that one of those things won't end up being your passion because you kind of have to grow to figure out what it is that you do love to do. Sean's completely right about that. For me, it wasn't until I saw Ed Sheeran and him playing an acoustic guitar and him singing the way he did that I thought, you know what, I can do that. I never really thought I could be Justin Bieber. I never really thought I could dance like him and be like him, but I can play guitar and I can sing like that. Ed, to me, was the most exciting 
musician there was because the guitar was his third arm and he was like using it as a real piece of him. And I love the way he played. I love the way he wrote songs and sang. He really inspired me. And sometimes it just takes a minute. It's waiting for the right time to kind of present itself to you. Ed was actually one of the first musicians who I ever met. And I flew out to LA the first time with my mom and he was performing on a show called The Voice. And we went there to meet him And he was so kind. I was backstage with him and he said to me, look, man, like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to do what you do. I want to play guitar and sing and be a singer songwriter. And he was like, then you have to put an insane amount of effort and work and love into what you do. And he's like, no matter who you meet, no matter how many people you meet, you have to show them so much love and you have to work really hard. And I think that his advice I'll always remember. I met you in 2015, I believe. Do you remember where it was? I think it was at the Staples Center. And Camila introduced us. He's talking about Camila Cabello, who was already one of my students. Yeah, we were backstage. I was talking to her. You came over. You were smiling, this big smile. And she said, this is my voice teacher, Eric Vitro. And do you know what you said? I don't remember. All right. Oh, okay. I got a few questions for you. (laughs) He started asking me about voice immediately. And the whole time we stood backstage, that's what we did. Talking about it. Yeah. I remember thinking, wow, he really is interested in being great. Like he really desires to get better. Yeah. Which was pretty impressive. And after all these years, Sean's dedication, it's still impressive. I spend most of my time preparing myself to do vocal lessons with you, preparing myself to how I'm going to feel after a vocal lesson. Am I going to have to meditate? Am I going to have to meditate before? Am I going to have to meditate somewhere in between? (laughs) So I guess a lot of meditation really ranks high in your life. Super high, but I need the meditation. Right, right. Sometimes I need the meditation. Sometimes you have to meditate before our lessons. But Sean didn't always meditate and journal. When I actually started taking it seriously and disciplined myself to meditate daily for 10 minutes at least, that was life-changing. Because it's not about the act of meditating for 10 minutes. It's about the moment of being in the vocal lesson and being like, let me just take a deep breath. It's the attitude. It's the motto of meditation, you know. I wake up in the morning. Something that really helps me kind of not go into an anxious state of thinking right off the bat is like getting straight into a cold shower and breathing and feeling my body and being like, all right, here we are. I get out of the shower and I go downstairs or outside. I find myself to somewhere where there's some light and I can see the sky or put my feet in the grass or something. And I do the Wim Hof breathing technique. And then maybe I'll meditate. Maybe I'll have a coffee. And even as I'm having my coffee, like I'm doing this all very mindfully, I'm sitting there with the coffee and I'm not letting myself check my emails or <laughs> my Instagram or my Twitter because this morning is for me. It's not for everyone else. And I think that that morning ritual of really letting myself be there and, and for myself really helps. And then I guess at some point later in the day, I'll find myself journaling and meditating and it's really helpful. Yeah. You know what I've never said to you? I thought it, but I've never said it. I've always been dying to say it as a joke, but I didn't want to put it in your head. But now you're so far beyond it. It's like, I told you someday this meditation thing would work out. Because I used to say, and you remember what you used to say to me? I can't meditate. I can't do that. No. Like you get really agitated. Oh, I used to get so, and you used to tell me to journal. I journal every day now. (laughs) Yeah. You, did you journal today? I didn't, but I will. I will. I will do it. And I never did. <laughs> and I could see that look in your eyes like, ask me one more time and no. I'm going to punch you. you know you. what? You can be so anxious you can't meditate. Like, yeah, I get it. Oh my God, yeah. But look at how far it's come. And, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, you were, you were telling me to meditate and journal the day I met you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I was telling him from the day I met him. But I'm so glad now it's a part of his daily routine. Sometimes I feel like we're in lessons and... I'll be sitting on the floor, kind of closed eyes, cross-legged and meditating for five minutes and you're just patiently waiting for me to come back to being human. But it's part of the process. And we've had tons of breakthroughs. And when we have a breakthrough, the most important thing to remember is that this will not be the last breakthrough. It's going to come around. It's going to happen again. You just have to be open to the fact that it's always changing and you can't do anything about that. And that's kind of the beauty of it. Comparing Sean from all those years ago when I first met him and knowing him now, I definitely see him as being much calmer and much more grounded. And I have to believe a lot of it has to do with the journaling and the meditation. 
I rest my case. Now don't go anywhere. Sean and I have even more to talk about. Backstage Pass will be right back. Welcome back. Let's keep going with Sean Mendez. I think it's time to talk about his favorite vocal exercise. The bottle. <laughs> Don't get me started about the bottle. We're going to have to explain that. I know. <laughs> it's not drinking. The bottle. It's not, yeah. it's not whiskey. <laughs> or vodka. Or vodka or tequila. Yeah. It's basically like a, a plastic water bottle with a straw attached to it. And you sing into the straw and you're blowing air through the straw. And you're kind of making bubbles in the bottom and you're doing scales. And I think the reason I love the bottle so much, it makes my voice feel better, but I think the bigger actual reason is because it frees me up from judgment and critique at the beginning of the lesson, you know? I can't really hear myself very well because I'm being muffled through water, so I'm okay with it if I miss a couple notes and it kind of frees you up. I think there's a lot of insecurity with singing when you have a lot of people watching. Sometimes I get so into it having to be perfect, I stop hearing my voice and I start making up what I'm hearing. And I'm, I'm like, Eric, it sounds scratchy and it sounds bad and, and I'm missing the notes. I have to sit down and kind of collect myself. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to move forward with this stuff. So it's taken a lot of work. When I first started working with Sean, I used to worry about his anxiety. And full disclosure, his anxiety gave me a lot of anxiety, but not anymore. After all these years of observing him, I now know he always pulls out of it. You know what's hard for me is doing mimis in, in a scale, like really chill and really quietly just going up. Even like at the beginning of the lesson when you asked me to go, hmm, ah, like doing that stuff, I get so freaked out about doing because I'm like, well... If you crack on one of these little simple things, you just suck. <laughs> That's the real truth. Like, If you ask me what we do in those lessons, sometimes I black out. Some days it's really hard. Literally, word for word, I've said to Eric over and over again, I don't know why, but I can't sing. And it's a scary place to be. And I think this subject goes across hundreds and hundreds of different types and ways it, it could be for people. But for me, it's this feeling of like, I've forgotten how to sing, or maybe I never even knew how to sing, or maybe I'm just getting away with this big trick. Maybe I'm not even a good musician at all. Sometimes I'm always like, if one day Eric was just like, I'm not doing lessons anymore, I'd be like, well, I can't sing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this big spiral that happens within the, the course of 20 seconds and Eric sees it in my eyes as they start to cross. And then, <laughs> okay, so sometimes it is my job to get people out of their heads. Make that quite often my job is to get people out of their heads. It's an occupational hazard. Some singers find singing scales up and down or singing major arpeggios really easy. So I'll throw in a minor one because when they start focusing on how to sing that unexpected minor note and tune, they can't pay attention as much to the quality of their singing voice. So then their voice can really open up. Or I'll have them do a variety of physical gestures so they completely forget about their voice because now all they can think about is all the ridiculous moves I'm making them do. Like for me, I, I go through this thing, I'm like, well, why can't I just sing? Because I can speak when I wake up, but you're doing vocal gymnastics and you really have to warm up. Otherwise you can really hurt yourself. But yeah, I still haven't learned that lesson. Well, yeah, because if you start listening to yourself with that perfectionistic ear right from the very beginning of the warm up, it puts you at a disadvantage because you're not going to sound great at the beginning of a warm up. That's the whole purpose of warming up. And sometimes it doesn't even sound great at the end of the warm up. Sometimes it takes doing a vocal warm up and then even taking 30 minutes of like resting your voice or 30 minutes of just eating some food or anything. And you come back and you're like, oh, wow, I am warmed up. It's just you were a little bit too inside of the practice. And I think the hardest part of singing is getting out of your own way, is dropping the ego and like just being a kid about it. Like when you're a kid, you just sing. When you're an adult, you're like singing, but at the same time also like critiquing and judging and like afraid. And one of the most amazing leaps we made as a duo was the day I 
was like realizing I was like not letting you tell me what the real objective thing was because I was so afraid and so anxious and I was like no 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 yeah yeah I don't want to hear that I don't want to hear that I wasn't listening to my teacher I was like I just have to get through it out of so much anxiety and then you're like I really think you should trust me that wasn't yeah. that long ago oh uh, you know and I feel like once I really like started to just like trust you and trust the process and trust me my voice started to open up more not only your voice but don't you feel better as a human being? I mean, I guess that is parallel to like to life in general. I love when we are just like cruising. Like I think for me, it's become a meditation too because I put my phone down for an hour. I just basically have headphones and I can only hear you and the piano. And I can be so focused on just the notes and my breathing and very present in my body. And you and I are very just zoned in and calm it's a beautiful experience i find a lot of the time i end up leaving the vocal lesson calmer the whole thing was a very zen moment even in the silence mm -hmm. when we're breathing i love those moments because that feels like the only hour of the day where things move that slow and carefree oh wow yeah yeah when people can let go it makes all the difference in the world. And like you said, be able to open your mind and go, all right, so tell me what to do and I'll do it and I'll trust it. Because if you can't trust your teacher, then who can you really trust? Totally. I mean, I think singers are so emotionally attached to their voice that sometimes we'll be backstage at an award show and we'll spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes warming up and then another 40 minutes just talking about the heart and calming down and getting into the right frame of mind to be able to do this. Even in our lessons, you end up accomplishing more when you're in the right frame of mind than doing an hour worth of scales stressed out and, and frustrated. And I think being a vocal coach, it's much more than going through scales with someone. I always call Eric my vocal coach slash therapist because <laughs> you're never like just doing one thing that's what you are in my phone your your bio is voice teacher slash therapist <laughs> well someone did say in an interview once i was their vocal life coach it's true you really are i love that phrase vocal life coach i thought that was one of the biggest compliments i had ever gotten because my lessons aren't always about vocal placement sometimes the most important thing is helping a student get mentally ready for a show something that helps me a lot is that I say to myself before a vocal lesson, I say to myself before a performance at the Grammys that this is just play. It's art. This is music. This is love. This is something that was created to make people feel. It sounds crazy, but sometimes the pressure in a vocal lesson that I put on myself is equivalent to the pressure backstage at the Grammys. And it's because they're the same thing to me. you got to sound perfect. Working on that on kind of toning that perfectionism down has been a really big part of my life. Yeah, I would actually say you're more nervous during our voice lessons than you are at award shows. Yeah, totally. At an award show, you kind of have no choice, but at a voice lesson, I can be like, I can't do this, I can't do this today. <laughs> and then I get more nervous. I can psych myself out a little bit more. I'm, already, I'm even sitting here right now being like, I'm talking too much, I'm gonna be tired for a vocal lesson in an hour. <laughs> so I find even if I'm doing a lesson, the thing that helps me the most is that if I'm three warm-ups in and I'm starting to feel myself get that perfectionist kind of vibe going on, my tunnel vision is going in, I just kind of shake my body like crazy and I go, <laughs> but I'll start like, <laughs> whatever, like to like laugh to get myself out of that little thing. It's like snapping myself out before I go into that perfectionist place. I say to myself in that moment, it's just fun. This is just play. Let's just have fun, you know? I always get the sense that a lot of times people in their mind think, well, when I or if I become really successful, if I make a lot of money, if I get a certain amount of success, if I'm number one on the charts, then I'll be happier. Then I'm going to feel really good. Yeah. I mean, this is a very touchy, a hard thing to talk about because when you say that Money and success doesn't bring you happiness. And maybe, maybe a bunch of people would jump to say, I'll oh, switch lives with me and, and I'll tell you, you know, and I'll, and I'll be happy, you know, if I had the money you had. Money does a lot of amazing things and success does a lot of amazing things for you. And it makes your life comfortable and easy. And it's the biggest blessing in the entire world. And I think you have to be aware of that. But at the same time, you have to be 
happy before you play the stadium for the stadium to make you happy because you're not going to get on the stage and walk off that night and lay in bed and be like, now I'm truly happy because I've played in front of 50,000 people. You can maybe make the ego happy, but I'm talking about the real heart. It has nothing to do with the 50,000 people. How did you feel when you were on the stage? Did you feel that you were being an honest kind of real version of, of yourself? And did you feel like there was love in the room? And, and was this thing very real? Then that's really what's going to bring you happiness. So it's just true. Happiness comes from within and not from outside success. Some of the most fun shows of my life have been in front of like 50 people. You're like sweating and everyone's screaming the lyrics as loud as you can. And there's this like insane amount of excitement in the room and the pressure is down and it just feels so intimate and close. And those have been some of my absolute favorite shows. Mine too. One of my favorites was at the Grammy Museum. <laughs> Me too. That was one of my favorite shows ever. And that was such a small audience. And it wasn't the same as a huge arena with everybody laughing and screaming and dancing and carrying on. But, oh, your voice sounded so beautiful. And the audience was totally with you, like they were breathing with you. Yeah, you have to just kind of like surrender to what the place you're playing wants to give you. And, and that night, I think sometimes you just get struck by a little bit of lightning. And that night had some lightning in it and it felt really amazing. I often will be on stage and I'm kind of singing with them. It's something that I think Bruce Springsteen had that I really admire and love. And it just feels like you're part of the people in like a really like kind of a small town way. And I always like to think about it that way. Right. I get that. I almost think of you sometimes when I've watched you, and this is going to sound really odd, but I think of you as kind of a healer because when I've seen you play with that audience, I see the look in your eye and the way they react to what you're doing. And I think I told you the first time I really saw that was at Radio City, right? Because that was many years ago. That was early on when we first started working together. No, that doesn't sound odd at all. Funny that you say that. I think that if I wasn't doing music, I'd probably be studying holistic medicine and, and healing. And so that lives really deep within me. So that's actually really sweet. I'm, I feel like you've never told me about the healer thing. I guess I haven't, but I always think about it. It goes back to that show at Radio City. I remember thinking to myself, wow, he is really playing with this audience in the best way possible. You know, you would do the thing when you would get really, really soft yeah. and there was that soft moment and you'd get them to quiet down. Then you get louder again. They'd get louder again. Don't leave me. Can you guys sing that? And I remember thinking, he really understands this. He's creating an incredible evening for these people. They are really enjoying this, and they're going to go home and talk about it, and they're going to remember it, and they're going to be inspired thanks, by it. thanks, Eric. Thank you. Stick around after the break for this week's vocal tip and more with Sean Mendez. If you want to do this exercise with me, you'll need a small bottle, half filled with water, and a straw. Don't forget to press pause while you go find them. Let's dive into this week's vocal tip. A lot of people feel anxiety before going on stage. I'm going to give you a few suggestions that will alleviate some of that stress before you even start to warm up your voice. If you're someone who likes to meditate, then meditate for a few minutes. If you're someone who enjoys yoga, then do some poses and stretches. Sometimes journaling can be very cathartic, so try writing in a journal. You can either write positive affirmations or you can write what you're feeling and what your fears are. Or if you have any anxiety about singing, write that down too. Get it all out of your system and free yourself from it before you start to practice. Do whatever starts to relax your body and take you away from the stress of the day. It's always worth taking a few minutes to do. Now, let's loosen up your body. Stand up, 
slightly bend your knees to take the pressure off your lower back, and just hang forward from the waist. You want your upper body to just be hanging forward like a rag doll. Let your head and arms hang loosely and freely. Take a deep breath in. You might even feel your back expand as you breathe in, and then just blow out. (sighs) Let all the tension out when you do this. Take another deep breath in, and then this time as you blow out, make a hissing sound as you slowly roll up into a standing position. Once you're in the standing position, take a deep breath and sigh. Ah, just let all the tension and the tightness of the day out of your body. Next, tilt your head forward and just do a gentle face shake. It's just to shake your facial muscles loose and free, but make sure it's gentle so you don't tense up your neck. Then you can really shake your entire body loose by shaking your hands and your legs and your face all together. Now let's work on your voice. You heard Sean mention that his favorite exercise is the bottle exercise, where he sings through a straw, blowing bubbles into water. Singing through a straw helps put your vocal cords in the best possible position and shape to create the vibrations that produce a free singing tone. Teachers explain this technique as setting up the most efficient way for your vocal cords to work. By singing through a straw, you will be automatically training the muscles of your larynx without trying to manipulate them physically. If you're looking for the technical term, it's often referred to as a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise because your breath is partially blocked, which creates a helpful back pressure in the vocal tract. But really, seriously, you do not need to understand any of that to have it help you. Just try it. Put a straw into a small bottle or a tall glass, half filled with water, and you'll see how helpful it can be right away. Let's blow some bubbles and get started, like this. Now you do that. Blow some bubbles into that water. Next, sing through that straw. Your turn. You can sing a simple arpeggio. Try that. or really any musical pattern and notes that you like. You can also try this on a song that you want to improve on. It can really help the song if you do it. Sing through the whole song, singing through that straw into the bottle. Now there are straws made especially for this and also bottles with built-in straws, but you can experiment at home with this with just a regular straw in a bottle. The size of the straw will increase or decrease the amount of resistance you feel, and how far you put the straw into the water will also make a difference. You'll feel what works best for you. By the way, you don't always have to sing into the straw and water. You can also sing into the straw and just feel the air flowing out. Put your hand about two inches away from the opening of the straw, and you should feel a steady stream of air blowing onto your palm. Then you'll really start developing that muscle memory of keeping the air flowing forward. And as you heard Sean say in our conversation, one reason he likes singing through the straw into water is because it muffles his voice so he can start his vocal warm-up freely without judging how his voice sounds at the beginning, which I think is a great idea. I always tell people when you begin warming up, the way your vocal cords feel is far more important than how they sound. If you want to try out the vocal tip from this episode, I'd love to hear it. Or maybe you want to share a bit from your journal or even a picture of the spot where you like to do yoga or where you like to meditate. Use the hashtag BackstagePassPod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, or wherever you like to post. I can't wait to see what you do with this week's vocal tips. I'll be back next week with another interview and another vocal tip. Talk to you then. Backstage Pass with Eric Vitro is written and hosted by me, Eric Vitro, and produced by Morgan Jaffe. Catherine Girardot is our managing producer. Emily Rostek is our associate producer. Mixed and mastered by Ben Tolliday. 
Additional engineering help from Jacob Gorski. Mia Lobel is our VP of Content. Director of Development Justine Lang helped create the show. Thanks also to Jacob Weisberg, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carly Migliori, Christina Sullivan, Eric Sandler, Maggie Taylor, Nicole Morano, Daniela Lacan, and Royston Bazur. Original theme music by Jacob and Sita Steele for Premier Music Group. We record at Resonate Studios. Fred Tallickson does our videography, and the photography is by Ken Sawyer. Special thanks to Michael Lewis for his inspiration, his friendship, and the best guidance anyone could ask for. Backstage Pass with Eric Vitro as a production of Pushkin Industries. If you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review. I mean that, really. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen to the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you were going to write an autobiography today, (laughs) what would you title it? Falsetto King. <laughs> no, I'm I say we say Falsetto King ironically because I had the hardest time learning how to sing falsetto. And now you don't. And now it's in this. That's the, that's that hard work. That's what I would title it. What would you title it? <laughs> that's what you would title it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I would title it. I I really don't know. Must mean I'm not ready to write it yet. Yeah, I guess yeah. not. Well, you know, there's a lot more to come. But. Yeah.